As we gather on this fourth Sunday of January, we gather recognizing that for generations, First Nations people walked these lands, their relationship with the land, with the turning of the seasons at the center of their spirituality and sense of identity. We have not always honored that relationship. And, and so we take a moment and we recognize these lands, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the neutral peoples. And we offer a prayer that we might find ways of living into right relationship, honoring their stewardship of the land, and praying for a time when we might build connections that all might flourish. Good morning. And welcome to this time and place of worship, our worship for Fairview United Church. Whatever has brought you here, whether you're joining us on Facebook Live in real time or later on on, on uh, Facebook or on YouTube, whether this is your first time joining us or you've never missed a service, 
Welcome and thank you for being with us this morning. I'll be sharing some announcements later on in the service, but for now I invite us to just take a moment and center ourselves wherever we are. Our hymns for this morning were pre-recorded in the sanctuary before the, um, the, 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 the stronger, stricter measures came into place last week and, and the very strong message of stay at home that, that we have been hearing since. And so um, let us come into this worship space by lighting a candle. And if you have a candle at home, I invite you to light it at this time. We light a candle that represents Christ's presence here in our midst whenever we gather. And so let us come into worship in song. Come all you people, come praise your maker. Come all you people, come praise your maker. Come all you people, come praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. Come all you people, come praise your maker. Come all you people, come praise your maker. Come all you people, come praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. Come all you people, come praise your maker. And so as individuals yet forming a group together, a community of faith, we gather to listen, to reflect, to sing, to hold each other in prayer, lifting up the joys and sorrows of our lives. And so let us enter into this time of worship together and let us pray together. Beckoning God, we come to you today standing on the shorelines of our lives, standing at the in-between time of the recent past and the now, seeking connections. May what transpires today fill us with a love greater than we have ever experienced. And may the Holy Spirit seek us out, inspire us, and bring us to a place where our relationships will be built stronger and rooted ever more deeply in your love. Amen. Our opening hymn is in Voices United, Bring Many Names. And if you want to look up the music, it's number 268.
We all make mistakes. We all do and say things we later come to regret. We see brokenness in the world around us, both in our own lives and in the life of our church community and our wider society. Our prayer of confession is a chance to reflect on places where we carry brokenness, where we carry regret, and to release that into God's hands. And so let us pray. God of all people, on this Sunday when we again hear stories of call, we recognize that we are called. And yet we don't always want to listen. Sometimes we want to run in the opposite direction. We're afraid that we'll be asked to change our plans, to do something that maybe we'd rather not do, that might impact our comfortable, complacent way of living. Loving God, call us again push and pull us out of that complacency. Open our hearts to know your way. Make us bold, make us strong, make us yours. Call our name once again as we open our hearts in the silence of this space. And so as we lift up our heads and our hearts, may we be reminded that in the deep of the night, in the brightness of the day, God calls to us. God is there in our heads and in our hearts, loving us, waiting for us to receive that call, waiting for us to act on that call. May we receive God's call boldly, trusting it completely. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're changing up the order a little bit this week. Um, and, uh, and so now let us turn to our anthem and enjoy this musical offering.
We come now to a time of, of sharing in scripture and reflection. And I wanted to do this a little differently this week, in part because um, of, of those, the scripture readings that we're dealing with. Uh, the first one we're going to explore a little bit is the story of Jonah. And um, the story of Jonah is um, an interesting, kind of unique story in the Bible, I think. Um, and I hope I'm not going to burst anyone's... Um, bubble here um, by naming the book of Jonah in its entirety, all four chapters, as a work of satire. Um, I know that, um, I, I think sometimes we're uncomfortable to look at something in the Bible and to see it as being funny. Um, but that's what the book of Jonah is. It's a work of satire. What what is satire? I'm just going to pull up the, the definition here. According to the Oxford Languages app, this satire is the use of humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices, particularly in the context of contemporary politics and other topical issues. So, so how was the... the um, work of Jonah a satire. Well, it has all of the pieces. It has your stock characters. It has um, humorous elements. Um, we have a prophet. And, and I know we, we hear when we think of prophets, we think of Isaiah, we think of Jeremiah, we think of um, Hosea, Amos. We, we, we think of all of these um, folks who spend their lives um, naming the um, the inconsistencies that they see around them, the, the problems they see around them. Some of the some of the prophets are focused on social justice and some of them are focused more on sort of the, the correct um, religious practices of, of the people. And prophets um, uh, decry the things they see as going wrong and um, often are not listened to. And so here we have this, this story of Jonah who um, is asked by God to go and um, to, uh, to tell the city of Nineveh, the great city of Nineveh, to repent. Now, Nineveh is a city in um, either Babylonia or Assyria, one of the, um, the, the tribes, one of the countries that is basically an enemy country to Israel. And so we're told in this story that Jonah is to go and, and tell them to repent. And Jonah, the prophet, who is an upstanding person, decides to run in the opposite direction. Depending on the translations, we hear Spain, we hear Tarshish, but the whole point is it is as far in the opposite direction from Nineveh as he could possibly go. And um, you're familiar with the story, I'm sure. There's a, a, a big storm on the ocean. The, the sailors don't know what to do. They're all praying and, and um, they, they, they're all worried. And Jonah's downstairs sleeping. They, they pull him into the mix and he says, oh yeah, it's you know it's because of me. Throw me into the water. And they say, no, no, no. And they try and save him. They row him to shore, but they don't get there. And eventually, against their own desires, they they throw him into the, the water. The storms go away. The the, the the sea is quiet again, and Jonah gets swallowed by a fish. Um, while in the fish, he repents, and of course, the fish spews him out onto the beach. God says, all right, Jonah, off you go to Nineveh. And Jonah goes, and all he says is, got 40 days, this place is going to be destroyed. And we are told that everything, everyone listens to him. The people repent, the king repents, the king has all the people repent. He dresses everyone, including the cows. 
in sackcloth and ashes. And um, so a massive success. Here's Prophet, who has been an actual success. So you'd think Jonah would be happy. He's done what he said. He has, he, everyone has listened to him. This never happens for a prophet. But is Jonah happy? No. He's upset. And he cries to God and says, I knew you were going to do this, so I should just die. Um, and uh, God sort of says, well, you know, it's, that's, it's my decision to, to do what I do. It's a funny story. It is, if we, if we take the time to look at it. But also a commentary, a commentary written for the Israelite people to, 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 to use it to be really a mirror that shows back to them in some ways how ridiculous they've been and, and how, um, how, how they need to, to do some changing themselves. And even this horrible city of Nineveh, even the cows repented. So let's uh, prepare to hear a part of this, this text and let's, let's get in the mood for it by singing a, a song that I learned as a child. It was my earliest memory of the, the story of Jonah, a uh, tune you're all familiar with, uh, to um, the story of, of, of part of the story of Jonah. So let's sing that now. So our song brought us up to the, the belly of the fish. The Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city and he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. 
Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in the night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals? And that ends the, the, in many ways, political, religious commentary, satirical commentary of, of the book of Jonah. And so we move now into um, another kind of call story. And, and last week we heard two different call stories. We heard the calling of Samuel. Samuel, who was sort of bemused by his calling, didn't really didn't really understand that he was being called, went to Eli, and, and um, there was so, sort of a sense of uncertainty about what was going on. We heard the calling of Nathaniel and Philip from the Gospel of John. Um, Nathaniel, sort of a really kind of a skeptical call, like, can anything good come out of Nazareth? We had Philip who, um, who felt seen and, and accepted uh, his, his calling a, a little more um, uh, readily. Um, we've now heard the story of Jonah and, and talked a little bit about the story of Jonah, but if we pull out that piece of call, um, Jonah flees opposite direction, off to Tarshish, maybe we'd say Timbuktu, runs in the opposite direction. And here we have now another call story from the Gospel of Mark, um, one that introduces us to some of um, Jesus' early disciples and um, um, puts us in the context of um, Jesus ha having been baptized, we have the temptation, and we hear that John the Baptist has been arrested. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw John, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and they followed him. Herein is good news and, and a, a story to, to reflect on. And so let us pray. 
May our thoughts, our words, our deeds always be rooted in your love, gracious God. Amen. The different sounds of the calls in our lives. Last week, I explored a little bit the idea of call and the idea, uh, um, putting it in contrast, the idea of being shoved into something. Are we, are we, are we called or are we pushed? What we're experiencing right now as, as we're in this um, time of, of lockdown and pandemic, this, this, um, this, this idea that, that we're not really in a situation we've chosen to, do, to, to be in, but is there, um, is there, will there, do we trust, do we hope that, that there will be some um, form of, of redemption or grace that, that will emerge and, and some of the, the medical and, and um, things that we've seen emerge over, over the past um, months. Today we get uh, probably the most well-known of the call stories. It's, it's a story that appears in, in all of the Gospels um, in, in one form or another, the, the calling of, of the early disciples who were fishermen and that image of, of fishing for men. Now I've heard it reflected upon that on the one hand, this can be a bit of a troubling image. It's an image we know really well. It's an image um, that we explore every year. And yet, fishing, if we use it in, the, in, um, in relationship with evangelism, can it be problematic? Because what are you doing when you fish? You are using bait to capture, um, to trick, really, uh, a fish into biting on so that you can then take it and eat it, which... I don't know about you, but for me, that's a really uncomfortable notion of, of evangelism, uh, bringing people into the church, tricking them to get them in the door and then, and then, and then it not working out so well for them. Um, and yet I was reflecting this week, um, and, and came upon a reflection that, that suggested that, um, Yes, uh, Jesus uses the, the language of fishing when he's, when he's talking to, uh, to John and to James, but they were fishermen. And, and so Jesus is using the language they know to, um, to, to spread his message, to, um, to invite them into relationship, to, to invite them to join them, to bring their skills, their gifts, their knowledge set into their ministry with him. And isn't that what we as a church are, are trying to do. I think of the, the process a Fairview congregation went through with Joe Ramsey two years ago, a process of looking at naming and exploring the gifts and skills that we have as individuals and that we bring into relationship, that we bring into our church community, and that then those gifts and skills and interests and passions help inform how our congregation lives out its mission in the community. And in many ways, the mission of the church then becomes the mission of the, the people within the church. And I know as we, as we spend time looking towards our future, we're continuing, we're continually called to, to look at those gifts, those skills, those passions, to look at how they intersect with the needs of our community, the, the, um, the place for, for our church within the wider context. I know I've, I've heard that, that idea of call being where our deep joy meets the world's deepest needs. Uh, I'm not quoting it quite word for word. I'm not looking at it right now. But, but where our deep passions and joys intersect with what we have to offer the world. 
as we look to the future, my prayer for our church family, for our church community, is that we will continue to hold at our core that sense of calling as being where what we have to offer meets the needs of the community around us. And that out of that, we'll develop a, a sense of mission and a sense of where we are truly being called in this time and this place as a church family and community. As we look to the future in hope and in faith. Amen. ways that we contribute to the life and work of being the church together and that's true at this time just like any other and so as we listen to this musical offering may we reflect on how we can continue to support the life and work of our congregation and church family
So let us pray. With these gifts, loving God, we present also ourselves and our varied ministries. May each of us be a part of your answer to the cries of the world. Amen. We come now to a time of sharing and announcements. Of course, we still don't know how the next couple of weeks are going to play out. Um, I imagine um, we may be continuing to film from, from home with a combination of, of pre-recorded hymns, but, but we'll certainly see. Um, our online groups are continuing strong and, and many of you have been out to either the scripture group on Wednesday morning that looks at the readings for the coming week or um, the Sunday morning conversation group. Um, I apologize for not getting the, the topic out in good time this week. I, I, I will try and do that better next week and get that topic out um, on Friday so that, uh, so that you know what to expect on Sunday morning, even if there's no prep required. Um, I know that we have a couple of birthdays in the congregation this week. Um, Brenda uh, Knox Krakow's birthday was this past Thursday or Friday. And, um, and Liz Ryan's birthday is tomorrow, I believe, on Monday. And so we wish you a, a happy birthday. And um, if you have uh, another uh, a birthday or anniversary to announce, please put it in the comments so that we can hold you in prayer. Um, we continue to hold, in terms of prayers of concern, we continue to hold um, June Reed's brother Bruce in, in prayer and, and their family. Um, and I think while this week there was a sense of, um, of, of joy and hope from our neighbors to the south, we continue to hold them in prayer as, as these next few weeks unfold. And so let us gather our hearts and minds together in prayer. Loving and gracious God, we give thanks for the many blessings of life, for family and friends, for neighbors and loved ones, those who fill our lives with joy and companionship, even while we are apart. We give thanks for technology that it allows us creative ways to come together. We give thanks for birthdays and anniversaries, for the ways we mark time and, and celebrate life and mark the passing of the seasons, even as we recognize the turning of the seasons outside. We lift up those who are, are celebrating this week, Brenda and Liz and anyone who has, um, has, has put their birthday or anniversary in, in the comments. And for all of the celebrations in our lives, we give thanks. And yet we recognize that we come to worship, we come before you as whole people, complete with worries and fears, anxieties. We're in month 10 of the world being turned upside down. And it's been difficult and continues to be difficult with unknowns and uncertainties. And so we lay the, those uncertainties and concerns open before you. We lift up the prayers of our hearts, prayers for those we know who are ill, who are grieving, who feel alone. We lift up June's brother, Bruce, and June's family and all those we put before you now in the silence of this space. We offer up the prayers of our hearts, those that we've named aloud and those we carry too deep for words, trusting in your presence with us always. And so now may we join generations before us in praying the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to say in whatever language or version is most comfortable to you. One common language is on the PowerPoint. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is a favorite of mine and, and one that I hold up as, as one of our, our core callings to be uh, the church in this time and in this place. It's number one in more voices. Let us build a house. Oh, oh, oh. 
As we go forth into our day, may we go with the grace and peace of God, knowing that we have been called to lead change in our community and the world. May we go into our day living out that good news with God's tender blessing on each and every one of us, now and always. Amen. Go make a difference, we can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference, we can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference, we can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world. Go make a difference. We can make a difference. Go make a difference in the world.